Welcome to the Plume and Page. Today's story is the Princess on the Glass Hill. Once upon a time, there was a man who had a meadow which lay on the side of a mountain, and in the meadow there was a barn in which he stored hay. Every St. John's Eve, when the grass was at its height, it was all eaten clean up, just as if a flock of sheep had nodded down to the ground during the night. This happened once, and it happened twice. But then the man grew tired of losing his crop, and said to his sons, he had three of them, and the third was called Cinderlad, that one of them must go and sleep in the barn on St. John's Eve, for it was absurd to let the grass be eaten up again, blade and stalk. The eldest was quite willing to go to the meadow. He would watch the grass, he said, and he would do it so well that neither man nor beast nor even the devil himself should have any of it. So he went to the barn and lay down to sleep. But when night was drawing near, there was such a rumbling and such an earthquake that the walls and roof shook, and the lad jumped up and took to his heels, and the barn remained empty again that year. Next St. John's Eve, the second son was willing to show what he could do. He went to the barn and lay down to sleep, as his brother had. But when night fell, there was a great rumbling, and then an earthquake, which was even worse. When the youth heard it, he was terrified and went off, running as if his life depended upon it. The year after, it was Cinderlad's turn. But when he made ready to go, the others laughed at him. Well, you are just the right one to watch the hay. You who have never learned anything but how to sit among the ashes and toast yourself by the fire, said they. Cinderlad, however, did not trouble himself about what they said, and when evening drew near he rambled away to the outlying field. He went into the barn and lay down, but in about an hour's time the rumbling and creaking began, and it was frightful to hear. Well, if it gets no worse than that, I can stand it, said Cinderlad. In a little time the creaking began again, and the earth quaked so that all the hay flew around the boy. Oh, if it gets no worse than that, I can stand it, said Cinderlad. Then came a third rumbling, and a third earthquake, so violent that the boy thought the walls and roof had fallen in. When that was over, everything suddenly grew as still as death around him. Cinderlad thought the upheaval would come again, but everything was quiet, and everything stayed quiet. After a short time, he heard something that sounded as if a horse were chewing just outside the barn door. He crept to the door to see what it was, and there stood a horse eating away. It was so big and fat, and fine a horse, that Cinderlad had never seen one like it before. A saddle and bridle lay upon it, and a complete suit of armor for a knight, and everything was of copper so bright that it sparkled. Ha ha! It is you who eats our hay, then, said the boy. I will stop that. So he made haste and took out his flint for striking fire, for it has a power over animals. He threw a spark over the horse, and then it could not stir from the spot, and the boy could do what he liked with it. He mounted and rode away to a place no one knew of but himself, and tied the horse up. When he went home, his brothers laughed and asked how he had got on. You did not lie long in the barn if you have been even as far as the field, said they. I lay in the barn till the sun rose, said the boy. What made you two so frightened? Well, we shall soon see whether you have watched the meadow or not, answered the brothers. But they found the grass just as long and as thick as it had been the night before. The next St. John's Eve, neither of the two older brothers dared to go to the outlying field to watch the crop, but Cinderlad went, and everything happened exactly as before. There was a rumbling, and an earthquake, and then there was another, and then a third. All three earthquakes were much, very much more violent than they had been the year before. Everything became still as death again, and the boy heard something chomping outside the barn. When he went to look through a crack in the door, there was a horse standing close by the wall of the house, eating and chewing. It was far larger and fatter than the first horse and it had a saddle on its back and a bridle too, and a full suit of armor for a knight, bright silver, and as beautiful as any one could wish to see. Ho, ho, said the boy. 
It is you who eats our hay in the night. I will put a stop to that. So he took out his flint for striking fire and threw a spark over the horse's mane, and the beast stood there as quiet as a lamb. Then the boy rode the horse, too, away to a place where he kept the other, and then went back to his house again. I suppose you will tell us th the grass hasn't been touched this time either, said the brothers. Well, so it hasn't, said Cinderlad. And there it was, the grass standing as high and as thick as it had been before. But that did not make them any kinder to Cinderlad. When the next St. John's Eve came, neither of the older brothers was brave enough to go to the outlying barn to watch the grass. But Cinderlad dared to go. There were three earthquakes, each worse than the other, and the last flung the boy all the way across the barn. Then everything suddenly became still as death. When he had lain quietly a short time, he heard the chewing sound outside the barn. He peeped through the crack in the door, and, behold, there stood a horse just outside, much larger and fatter than the other two he had caught. The saddle and bridle were gold, and there was a suit of golden armor, too. Ho, ho! It is you, then, who eats our hay this time, said the boy, but I will put a stop to that. So he pulled out his flint for striking fire and threw a spark over the horse, and it stood as still as if it had been nailed to the field, and the boy could do just what he liked with it. He mounted the horse and rode away to a place where he kept the other two, and then he went home again. The two brothers mocked him just as they had done before, but Cinderlad did not trouble himself about that, telling them to go to the field and see. This time also the grass was standing, looking as fine and as thick as ever. Now it happened that the king had a daughter whom he offered to give to the one who could ride to the top of a very high hill of glass, slippery as ice, which stood close to his palace. Upon the top of this the king's daughter was to sit with three golden apples in her lap, and the man who was able to ride up and carry off the three apples could marry her and have half the kingdom. The king had this proclaimed throughout the whole kingdom, and in many other kingdoms too. The princess was very beautiful and all who saw her fell in love with her, in spite of themselves. It is needless to say that the prince and knights were eager to win her, and half the kingdom besides. They came riding from the ends of the world, dressed so splendidly that their raiments gleamed in the sunshine, and riding on horses which seemed to dance as they went. There was not one of these princes who did not think he was sure to win the princess. When the day of the contest arrived, there was such a host of knights and princes at the foot of the glass hill that it made one dizzy to look at them. Every one who could walk or even crawl was there to see who would win the king's daughter. Cinderlad's two brothers were there too, but they would not hear of letting him go with them, for he was so dusty and grimy from sleeping among the ashes that they said every one would laugh at them if they were seen in the company of such an oaf. Then I will go by myself, thought Cinderlad. When the two brothers appeared at the scene, the princes and knights were trying so hard to ride up the glass hill that their horses were in a foam. It was all in vain, for no sooner did the horses set foot upon the hill than down they slipped. Not one could get even so much as a couple of yards, for the hill was as smooth as a glass window pane and as steep as the side of a house. But they were eager to win the king's daughter and half the kingdom, so they kept riding and kept slipping. At length all the horses were so tired they could do no more, and so hot that the foam dropped from them, and the princes and knights were forced to stop. The king was just about to proclaim that the riding should begin afresh on the following day, when suddenly a knight came riding up on a horse of such beauty that one had never seen its like before. The knight had on armor of copper, and his bridle was of copper too, so bright that it sparkled. The other knights called out to him that he might just as well spare himself the trouble of trying to ride up the glass hill, for it was of no use. But he did not heed them, and rode straight off to it, and went up as if it were nothing at all. Thus he rode for a long time. It may have been a third of the way to the top, but turned his horse around and rode down again. The princess thought she had never seen so handsome a knight, and while he was riding up, she was thinking, Oh, how I hope he will be able to come to the top. 
When she saw that he was turning his horse back, she threw down one of the golden apples after him, and it rolled into his shoe. But when he reached the bottom of the hill, he rode away so fast no one knew what had become of him. All the princes and knights were bidden to present themselves before the king that night in order that he who had ridden so far up the glass hill might show the golden apple which the king's daughter had thrown down. But no one had anything to show. One knight after another presented himself, and none could show the apple. That same night, Cinderlad's brothers came back and had a long story to tell. At first they said there was no one able to get even so much as one step up the hill, but then came a knight who had armor of copper and a bridle of copper, and his armor and trappings were so bright they shone for a great distance. And it was a grand sight to see him riding. He rode one-third of the way up the glass hill, and he could easily have ridden the whole of it if he had liked. But he had made up his mind that that was enough. Oh, I should have liked to see him too. That I should, said Cinderlad. Next day, the brothers were about to set out again, and this time, too, Cinderlad begged to go with them and see who rode. But no, they said, he was not fit to do that, for he was much too ugly and dirty. Well, well, then I will go all by myself, thought Cinderlad. So the brothers went to the glass hill, and all the princes and knights began to ride again. Not one could even get so far as a yard up the hill. When they had tired out their horses so they could do no more, they again had to stop altogether. Just as the king was thinking it would be well to proclaim that the riding should continue next day so they might have one last chance, he suddenly thought it would be well to wait a little longer to see if the knight in copper armor would come on this day too. Nothing was to be seen of him, but just as they had stopped looking for him, a knight came riding up on a steed that was much, much finer than the one the knight in copper armor had ridden. This knight had silver armor and a silver saddle and bridle, and all were so bright they shone and glistened when he was still a long way off. Again the other knights called to him and said he might just as well give up the attempt to ride up the glass hill, for it was useless to try. But the silver knight paid no heed to them, and rode straight away to the glass hill, and went farther than the knight in copper armor had gone. When he had ridden two-thirds of the way to the top, however, he turned his horse around and rode down again. The princess sat longing that he might be able to reach her, and when she saw him turning back she threw the second apple after him, and it rolled into his shoe also. And as soon as he reached the bottom of the glass hill, he rode away so fast that no one could see what had become of him. In the evening, when everyone was to appear before the king and princess, one night after another went in, but none of them had a golden apple to show. The two brothers went home, as they had the night before, and told Cinderlad how everyone had ridden, but that no one had been able to get up the hill. But last of all, they said, came a knight in silver armor, and he had a silver bridle on his horse and a silver saddle, and oh, but he could ride. He took his horse two-thirds of the way up the hill, but then he turned back. He was a fine fellow indeed, said the brothers, and the princess threw the second golden apple to him. Oh, how I should have liked to see him too, said Cinderlad. On the third day, everything happened as it had before. Everyone waited for the knight in silver armor, but he was nowhere in sight. At last, after a long time, came a knight riding upon a horse that was so fine its equal had never yet been seen. The knight had golden armor, and the horse a golden saddle and bridle, and these were all so bright they shone and dazzled everyone, even while the knight was still at a great distance. The other princes and knights did not think to call to him how useless it was to try, so amazed were they at his magnificence. He rode straight away to the glass hill and galloped up as if it were no hill at all, and the princess had no time even to wish he might reach the top. As soon as he had ridden to the top, he took the third golden apple from the lap of the princess and then turned his horse around and rode down again. He vanished from sight before anyone was able to say a word to him. When the two brothers came home that night, they had much to tell of how the riding had gone that day, and at last they told about the knight in the golden armor too. He was a grand fellow. Another such splendid knight is not to be found anywhere in the world, said the brothers. 
Oh, how I should have liked to see him too, said Cinderlad. Next day, all the knights and princes were to appear before the king and the princess, so that he who had the third golden apple might produce it. They all went in turn, first princes and then knights, but none of them had a golden apple. But somebody must have it, said the king, for with our own eyes we all saw a man ride up and take it. So he commanded that every man in the kingdom should come to the palace to see if he could show the apple. And one after the other they all came. But no one had the golden apple. And after a long, long time, Cinderlad's two brothers came likewise. They were the last of all, so the king inquired of them if anyone else in the kingdom was left to come. Oh, yes, we have a brother, said the two. But he couldn't have the golden apple. He never left the cinder heap on any of the three days. Never mind that, said the king. As everyone else has come to the palace, let him come too. So Cinderlad was forced to go and appear at the king's palace. Have you the golden apple? asked the king. Yes, said Cinderlad. Here is the first, and here is the second, and here is the third too. And he took all three apples out of his pocket and with that threw off his sooty rags and appeared before them in his bright golden armor, which gleamed as he stood. You shall have my daughter, and the half of my kingdom as well, and you have truly earned both, said the king. So there was a wedding, and Cinderlad married the king's daughter, and every one made merry at the feast, for all of them could make merry, though they could not ride up the glass hill. And if they have not left off their merry-making, they must be at it still.' 